Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 84. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Bubba, who hasn't been on the podcast in a long time. Thanks for coming back on. Thanks for having me. We are here today to talk about golf. Not really a board game, but I figure it's a game. And then I had a realization while thinking, man, I really want to talk about golf and disc golf because I've been playing it and thinking about it a lot. And uh, it doesn't really fit in the podcast. And then I, I realized, wait a minute, this is my podcast. I can do whatever I want. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, I promise there will be <laughs> some discussion of how the principles we're going to be talking about with both golf and disc golf uh, relate back to board games. Because, of course, golf and disc golf are games. They're, they're physical games they're dexterity games of a type but they are in fact games and so a lot of the principles that we'll be talking about uh, relate to board game design in theory uh, i believe so even if you don't play sports you don't play golf you don't play disc golf i think you'll find some interesting discussion here i'm curious mark uh what what do you think i would agree with you that there's certainly games but what do you think differs a sport from a game well, like is there one thing or, or are there multiple things that i think contribute to a sport i mean i'm not a prescriptivist when it comes to definitions but i think the main difference is the physicality like a sport is an athletic game uh so i, I you know people say like chess is a sport no it's a game it's it's a mental game. Esports, maybe you could argue one way or another, because there, is, you know, with like a first-person shooter or an RTS, right? There is the physical aspect of it. Uh, you have to be quick with your your physical movements, but it's just on a much smaller scale. So maybe that's kind of in between. Uh, but I, I think the difference is the physicality. I would I would tend to use the word skill. The athleticism. Sport, sports require skills. Skills with your body. Fair enough. And that's where chess comes in, I guess. Yeah. Okay. That's how I see. I mean, that's, again, I'm not a prescriptivist, so I don't really care how people use the terms, but I think that's generally how people distinguish them, uh, is that a sport is a a competitive game that involves athleticism um, as the primary kind of mode of interaction rather than purely uh, mental decision making. Although, of course, there's aspects of both. Uh, which is what we're going to be talking about. But let's let's start with talking about, well, I guess first introduce, because disc golf is kind of a new thing relative to other major sports, and, it's, and not a lot of people have heard of it, presumably, although it is growing significantly. The pandemic was a huge boon to it. I assume most people are relatively familiar with regular golf, or as disc golfers call it, ball golf. Disc golf is very similar, but you're using Frisbee-like discs. The discs that are used are... Not exactly what you think of when you think of a Frisbee. Uh, They are smaller and more dense, so they tend to go further. But it's basically the same kind of idea as golf, but instead of throwing it in a hole, you throw it into a basket. Uh, So there's a platform, a a little metal cage on each hole, roughly, I don't know what the dimensions are, what, like two, two and a half feet in diameter? Apparently it's, it's almost exactly the same ratio as a golf ball to a golf hole. Interesting. Yeah, about two feet in diameter, and then uh, there are chains that are suspended above it, so you throw the disc into the chains, and that kills all of its momentum, and it falls down into the basket. Uh, other than that, they're, they're quite similar in, in terms of you're trying to get into the goal in as few attempts as possible, and that's the scoring method. Uh, but we'll be talking about some other uh, differences and similarities as we go on. So that that's kind of what we're talking about. Bubba, what's your history with ball golf? Because uh, I know ball? you play some, but how, how long have you been playing? Sure. Ball golf. Uh, I'm not a huge ball golfer, uh, unlike Mark here. I mostly dabble, but I got introduced to the game back in middle school, high school territory. Uh, I was actually a big tennis player back then. And there was a summer ca- camp my parents sent me to that was a tennis camp that was also a golf camp at the same time. So you weren't required to do both, but I did because I liked doing new things. And that was my first experience with golf. Grew up playing baseball, so I I hit the ball a country mile, but 
not anywhere where I wanted it to go. And that's pretty much still how my game is. I, <laughs> I can hit the ball far and can't very accurately. Nowadays, I probably play four to five times a summer and then who knows, some in between when I can. But that's pretty much the history with ball golf. Disc golf, on the other hand, I discovered, well, I, we kind of discovered it in college and it wasn't the traditional dif- disc golf sport. My college was huge into ultimate Frisbee. So we would play ultimate nonstop. And actually, this is probably very similar to Mark since we went to college together. But uh, I remember even my freshman year before Mark was there, we would just be throwing Frisbees around nonstop. And eventually we basically made our own disc golf course on the college campus and just threw at random objects, which included trees, telephone poles, sides of buildings, whatnot. One particular dorm room door. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So that's my history with the game. Uh, Ever since college, I've discovered the actual sport of disc golf through YouTube, through I live right next to two courses, which are awesome. So I've gotten into the game slowly over the years and have picked up discs and have been disc golfing ever since. Yeah, for me, it's funny that you played tennis and then discovered golf at a camp because I've been playing golf all my life, but I did once go to a tennis camp uh, in high, uh, maybe middle school. But yeah, I, I've been playing ball golf since I was five years old. My, my dad and my grandpa played quite a bit, uh, recreationally. And, uh, so they got me my first club, little tiny dinky thing. I think my mom still has it in the garage somewhere, a little tiny cut down seven iron. Uh, and I first swung at five years old, uh, from what they tell me. And then, Around seven to eight, I started expressing more of an interest to kind of learn. So I got my first kind of half set of clubs. I think it was like an old, again, cut down, used clubs, half set of irons and a putter and a driver or something like that. Around then, and I I played as much as I I could uh, and swung and practiced and we I did a couple of classes you know group classes uh, for kids wanting to learn golf and then at either 11 or 12 years old my I I still love the game and I started doing tournaments over the summers there are junior golf organizations uh, around the country one for each state that kind of form a national, uh, junior golf league. Although I should say maybe more than at least there were two in California. There was a northern and a southern, so I was part of the northern one. Uh, so around then, I think twelve years old, I started playing tournaments every summer and did that through uh, eighteen years old. When uh, you then age out of the junior tournament league, I never did particularly well. I, I came in last a lot, and I wasn't I wasn't that great, but I enjoyed it quite a bit. And one of the benefits of regular golf is that uh, they do make it very easy for young people to become involved. The problem is once you turn 18 or in some cases 19, uh, it then becomes very expensive because <laughs> golf is an expensive sport, uh, even if you're even if you're hunting for deals. Uh, so I played there. I, I never, again, I wasn't very good. I got last place a lot. My final year, I started getting a couple of good results. I got uh, two top five finishes at, at tournaments, uh, which is the peak of my success. I tried out for the college team, didn't quite make it, but it wasn't super enthused because I was more into debate at that time. And, and the debate club was going to be my my number one focus in college anyways, even if I had made the golf team. My best I ever got was, if some of you may not understand what this means, but the best I ever got was like a 7.6 handicap uh, index. Uh, which, how do I explain what that means? So if you have a zero handicap, you're it's called a scratch golfer. And that's like, not like PGA Tour professional, but like very, very good, like a local professional. And I was averaging on my good rounds, my best rounds, seven to eight shots worse than that, uh, which is still pretty good. I think the average... Like, if you take all golfers everywhere and average it out, the average handicap is like 20-something. So, I got decent. 
but not but not good enough to pursue golf really um in or not even close i mean the difference the difference between like a zero and an eight is way way wider than an eight and a 16 like it, it's worlds apart but i love golf i love golf i love sport i love it uh, even to this day, I've been playing, and I actually got back down to an eight. I'm in at eight point two right now after a couple of hot rounds here in the spring, which is exciting. With disc golf, I always kind of knew that disc golf was a thing. I don't know how because I did play it once or twice in high school. Uh, my f- my family would vacation a lot in the summers, and one year we'd always visit my my dad's parents, and they would they lived in Arizona, so they would usually go rent a place in August to get out of the heat. Uh, so a couple times they went to a, a town called, oh, what was the name of that town? Steamboat Springs. It's a big ski resort town. But in the summer, it's just kind of a, a pretty touristy kind of place. Uh, so we visited them a couple times in Steamboat. And they had a, a disc golf course there on the ski slope. So a couple times I played that, just borrowing a disc or two from the place there uh, with my dad. And then in college... You kind of walk into that school and they hand you a frisbee. So we, I did the same kind of thing with random courses, and then kind of forgot about disc golf until like two to three years ago, when the YouTube algorithm gave me randomly a disc golf video that looked super cool, and I'm like, hey, that's I forgot that existed. That sport looks kind of fun, and I, I've ne- I've not been able to play as much ball golf as I wanted just because it's so expensive. So I picked up some discs and started playing, and now I'm super hooked. And this year I've been playing a good number of tournaments. I uh, actually have one coming up tomorrow morning, and I've been doing a lot of tournaments this summer and trying to improve my game. Uh, I love the mastery aspect of it, of, of trying to improve, and it's much easier to do that with disc golf because it is, again, substantially cheaper. Uh, so that's my history with the games, and I do love them. I've also started, I guess I should plug myself, a YouTube channel and Instagram for my disc golf ventures. It's very small and fledgling, uh, but if you look up Mark underscore disc golf, you'll find it there uh, if you want to track my progress on trying to not be terrible at disc golf. (laughs) With that, we have some history with the games. I do adore them both, Um, and I do think that they are games. As we mentioned before, I I think the difference between a sport and a game is just the matter of the athleticism and the physicality of it. And in terms of how they play and how we can think about the games, I mean, it's very, very similar to a dexterity game because it's competitive. There are rules. If you have a head-to-head match, you can win or lose, although in both golf and disc golf, a lot of it is is kind of a high score kind of thing. Um, so it, they function frequently as you might see a solo game uh, where you're trying to reach certain score thresholds. Uh, But there are situations where you can go head to head against other people. But to me, I don't see a whole lot of distinction other than the fact that one place takes place outdoors and board games typically take place indoors. And, you know, the physical or geographical size required to play the game. I, I don't necessarily think there's a huge delineation between board games and sports. Yeah, I, I do think that, especially with golf and disc golf, the biggest thing is, and you mentioned it, that it acts very much like a solo game. Like you said, there there are times when you can you absolutely play against other people, but even when you're playing against other people, their decisions have almost, uh, unless it's like, the last shot of a tournament, as we saw with Worlds, if you happen to watch that coverage, it, it's very rare that what someone else is doing is making an impact on your decision making in golf and disc golf. What that means for those two games is that much of the course design and much of how individual courses are set up is the game. And it's how do how does that play into how you attack each individual hole. And I think that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think you're correct. And, and for those who are at least any way interested in either sports or disc golf or just good old fashioned drama, go look up world's 2021 disc golf tournament. Cause it was insane. One of the best sporting events I've ever watched bar none. It was, it was absolutely amazing. But yeah, they, they do function kind of as 
solo games side by side with other players if you're in a tournament setting. But most of the time, you're not in a tournament setting. You're just going out and playing. In that sense, it's just you against the course. It's you against the randomness of nature and your own skill. And in that sense, there's a lot of what we would call output randomness in these games, right? You do something and yes, your skill plays a large part of the result of that, but there's lots of luck factors outside of your control once you either hit the ball or throw the disc, which then becomes input randomness for your next throw because then you have to deal with the consequences of what happened there, uh, which works, I think. Both games can become very frustrating. A lot of people find golf to be a very, very frustrating sport for those reasons. But I think that's part of the charm of the sport is that you're always struggling. You're always going to get bad breaks. You're going to get good breaks. You're going to have shots that are perfect. You're going to have shots that you don't understand how you messed up so so badly. And I think that struggle is kind of the main appeal of these of these sports. I think mastery is the other appeal too. Cause yeah. like, well, when you have, when you're watching pros, whether it be golf or disc golf, the, the delineation is so, so clear in disc golf. It's all putting. If one of you go out and try to set up at a disc golf basket, say 30 feet away, and you've never thrown a, a, a Frisbee at a basket before, you probably make like one in 10 shots. And when you're looking at pros, they're at like a 95, 96% clip from 30 feet, which is just well, incredible. They're about 30 or 80%. It seems like well, it's 90 when you're watching, when you're typically watching the people winning the tournament at that time, it's the best right. in the world who are also playing very well. So it, it you gotta you gotta buy a sample size, uh, Absolutely. but yeah. But Absolutely. if you look up the stats, uh, about eighty percent average for men pros uh, from Circle One. Yeah, and and the same can be said for regular golf too. When you look at stats such as like greens and regulation and just like fairways hit, I mean, you try to match those numbers out on a golf course yourself, and you're not even coming close. And it, it's that's the other part of the frustration, I think, too, is the mastery curve for these skills is incredibly high, especially in ball golf. Um, I, I certainly haven't mastered disc golf either, but my sense is that it's probably slightly easier to master than ball golf just because of how far away from your body you're actually hitting a tiny little golf ball uh, as opposed to controlling a disc with your hand. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. I do think ball golf is more difficult. It has a much more difficult initial learning curve. Like I could take someone, you know, a, a, you know, an average person, give them a disc and get them throwing 150 to 200 feet in an afternoon. With golf, I'm not going to be able to get someone consistently striking the ball in one afternoon. I could get right. someone to do a couple of good shots. And I think I'm a pretty good golf teacher, actually. I think I'm actually a better golf teacher than I am a player. And the the variables with ball golf are just so much smaller. Like the difference, like a, like a centimeter difference is massive in striking a golf ball. A centimeter difference in throwing is probably not that big of a deal in, in disc golf. I think so. Yeah, I think the initial curve is higher. I think probably the... I don't know. I think golf is just harder. I think we'll eventually see now that we've disc golf is becoming more popular and more people are dedicating a lot of time and effort into becoming masters of disc golf. I think maybe in five years we'll see a much bigger difference than like your average enthusiast and the top pros than we see now. I think that will start to stretch out quite a bit and become closer to what we see in ball golf. Like we're just now in disc golf getting to the point where like kids are deciding to focus on trying to become a professional at disc golf. Like that is just starting. Like there's one, maybe two top pros now who have been super enthused about doing that from child young age. Yeah. In ball golf, that, that's, there are that's fair. there are thousands of eight year olds right now who are who want to put in a lot of work to try to become a, a good golfer in disc yeah. golf. There's maybe a dozen if I had to guess. So that's a difference, but I think that's going to rapidly increase in disc golf uh, because of the massive growth of the sport. 
I believe Innova, which is the largest manufacturer of discs, based on their sales, estimates that 50% of the disc golfers that exist right now started playing in the last year and a half. To, to, That's a crazy stat. Yeah. To, to put in perspective how fast the sport has grown. Well, because yeah. it's just I wouldn't a great be sport for the, for, in a pandemic. You can go out by yourself and not be around anyone and just hike around in the woods and it's right. easy. You know, it costs, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks to get a couple of discs and just play. Super easy easy entry point and it you can do it in a pandemic. So it did explode quite a bit. But I think the learning curve in terms of progressing your skills is much more difficult in ball golf than it is disc golf. If you had to say in the next, say, 10 years, if disc golf keeps growing on, on this pace, what specifically about disc golf do you think will get better at the pro level? Do you think it's distance? I mean, to me, there's there's like elite putters out there. And I don't, honestly, I don't see how you can get much better at putting than our the current pros out there right now. That's an interesting question because I don't know. I don't think max distance will increase that much. There's only so much you can do in terms of an athletic body propelling a disc. I mean, the distance gains in ball golf have been largely technological. Correct. And I don't see within the parameters of like how a disc can be made if there are any technological gains for distance, unless the technical parameters actually change like the rules change for a legal disc i think we'll see more pros having what we would call now super elite distance so having 550 600 feet um i think that will over the next five to ten years become more or less a requirement to be a top pro whereas right now it's not necessarily so i think we'll see more people with that elite distance i think the the biggest gain in what distinguishes the top five or so disc golfers in the world right now from numbers six through 20 is the level of precision at distance. And so I think that's where uh, the biggest gains will be made and where courses will need to adapt to become not either long or either or narrow, but both. And that's what's going to challenge people. So hitting gaps at two to 300 feet that are five feet wide consistently is what's going to become the distinguishing factor between the very best and the average touring pro. That's fair. I think you're right. I, I think putting gains are marginal once you, you know, perhaps we'll see bigger gains in like circle two putting. So that's, that'd be between 10 and 20 meters. So right now, like the best in the world are hitting that range at about 30%. So I think there's room for more mastery there. Maybe you will see those numbers creep up. I think once you get near 100, you know, the best in the world right now are hitting circle one putts at 90%. I think Paul Ulibarri is the number one in the world this year, and he's at like 90 or 91%. You know, the, you can only go so high there, right? No one's going to ever hit 100%, and you miss one or two, and now you're in the mid to low 90s. Like, you know, that's there's not much room to improve right. past that point it's like free throws in basketball right like exactly Steve, that is a perfect Steve nash was perfect what 92 93 percent like and he was the best ever you know yeah, obviously you want all your pros to creep up towards that number but there's not really any room to do better than that <laughs> right right and that was kind of my point in asking that question because i, I wasn't really sure and and i think that that's again where this conversation is heading is how how are these courses going to adapt over the next few years as people get better, as we want to make courses more interesting to make the game more fun and entertaining and yeah, so, fun to watch, fun to play, et cetera? Yeah. So let, let's talk about course design, right? So if, if golf and disc golf are these solo games, the the part that make them interesting are the actual courses you're playing on or the actual setup of the game. Uh, if it was just a wide open field with a target, it would become fairly dull. You know, it would just become another form of darts, which is a fine game, but darts is never going to be insanely popular as a professional sport just because of how limited it is. I think the courses are what make the game. And I have a, a particular interest in course design because I see a lot of parallels with course design and, and just general game design. 
So a bit of history, and if you want to read up a lot on this, there's a really, really great website called The Fried Egg that talks about the history of golf course architecture and golf course design. And that's where I got most of this information is from reading basically everything they've written on that website. Uh, And that's just thefriedegg.com. So in the history of golf, it starts out in Scotland and England and Ireland on what would they call the lynx land. So it's like sheep pastures by the ocean. And so the sheep would keep the grass low uh, and then they put out some targets and that's kind of where golf begins. And then they start designing specific courses to play on in those areas. And then they start thinking of how do we make this more interesting? How do we add obstacles or things to work around? And the earliest idea for what a good course is made of is what we would call the penal school of design. And that is essentially the worse that your shot is, the the, the more poorly you execute a shot, uh, the more you're punished on your next shot. Uh, so you have then what we call the fairway, which is kind of where you're aiming, uh, and then the rough, which is kind of the penalty zone, right? It's harder to hit out of the rough, uh, and that's where you're offline. And that's a very important concept still in both games, right? That you should be generally, you should be punished for poor shots. And that's just a feedback loop that you want to have. That's kind of fundamental to any game, right? Any game, if you want decisions to matter, there needs to be consequences for bad decisions or bad execution. And there needs to be some kind of benefit for good decisions or good executions, or else you just have random chaos. An aside there. Again, going back to uh, Disc Golf Worlds this past year, they had a hole, I believe it was hole seven at the fort, which was one of the two courses they played, where the commentators on the hole consistently brought up the fact that uh, you could, I believe it was either a par four or five, and you could throw your first shot out of bounds and your second shot or you're shooting three from a drop zone, but that drop zone was in such a preferable position that unless you cured your tee shot, the drop zone was essentially better. You had a better chance of parring the hole than any other shot on the course, unless you threw an absolutely perfect tee shot. So they were, they were saying in some cases, it might be better just to throw OB on your tee shot than to attempt for this pure, perfect drive. And and I just bring that up as an example of this penal philosophy failing uh, on this one particular hole. And that's something that irked me on on that one particular course this year at Worlds. Um, Any thoughts on that? Was that the hole with the fence kind of in the middle of the fairway? Uh, Yes, it had a fence in the middle. Yeah, that makes perfect sense because, you know, if you get in too thick of woods, and disc golf is often played in in, in the woods uh, where trees are your main obstacle, you know, if you have areas that are too thick with trees, you would almost rather take a penalty shot and just get in the open than try to throw out because your your chance, you have a chance of not escaping the pen, the tree penalty with your pitch out. I don't remember that, but yeah, that's a perfect example of, of that idea, not going well, um, which makes it tricky when you have drop areas, uh, which for those who who don't know, that's like just a designated spot that you play your next shot at if you go out of bounds, which which can happen in both sports. It's not always the case, but both sports have that as an option for course designers. Typically, they're used on a forced water carry. So if you have like an island green in either sport or just even a forced water carry, they don't want to have a situation where someone is unable to clear the water and then they rack up, you know, 20 shots trying and losing balls or discs trying over and over again. So they'll put a drop zone like just on the other side of the water. That's that's where I see that most frequently. But yeah, that's a, that's a perfect example of that failing. And I think it's called a school of design, but to me it's like just a fundamental principle that you should violate intentionally in careful ways but it underlines the entire point of the game like it's so fundamental that you should only violate the idea very purposefully and that's where we get to the next school of design that we talk about in golf course architecture and that's called the strategic school Uh, There's a really cool article on the Friday about where this began, and and I can't remember the name of the course, but it was in the mid-19th century where 
some guy, I don't know if he was the owner of the course or the head pro or the architect or whatever, uh, he wanted to make a hole more interesting. So he, he discussed some plans, but everyone hated it. So he ended up just doing it in the middle of the night. So no one could stop him where he dug a bunker, a, a hazard right in the middle of the fairway on this particular hole. <laughs> and what this did is it violates the penal school because it's the middle of the fairway and you shouldn't be punished necessarily. The idea is that you shouldn't be punished for hitting the ball in the middle of the fairway. But what it did is it opened up two routes and the wider route, if you went, I believe to the left of the bunker and landed in the fairway, that was the most wide open shot. That was the larger stretch of fairway horizontally. If you did that, you had an, a worse angle to the green on your second shot going in. If you took the more narrow route to the right and were successful, you had the, the preferable angle going into the green. And that's kind of the prototypical idea of the strategic school of design is that you give people options and you create almost little push your luck games within the course. Another clear example of a strategic kind of hole is what we call a cape hole. Uh, which is where you have a golf hole or a disc golf hole. It works either way. That kind of curves around a body of water. So it plays like along a lake or along a pond. And then you have a decision of how far over the water you want to risk your shot. So you could go for, you know, clearing a big chunk of the lake and you cut the corner. But if you fail, of course, you're in the water or you can play it safe. And if you play it safe, you will then have a more difficult and longer second shot because you haven't progressed down the, the hole as far. That's another kind of strategic idea. And I think golf courses and disc golf courses that really try to create strategic decision making are fantastic. In a golf course architecture, it was super prevalent around the turn of the century and in the early 20th century, where they call it the golden age of golf architecture, where this strategic mindset really thrived. And then mid-century, there was a big boom of golf courses that were trying to be super accessible and, and simple that we get a lot of super mediocre golf courses in the United States, at least. And then only in the last 20, 30 years has this kind of classic strategic way of thinking uh, flourished again in ball golf. In disc golf, I see it as we're basically in that mid 19th century spot where strategic decision making is just starting to peek its head through. So as far as I understand the history of disc golf course design is basically, I mean, disc golf was created by a bunch of hippies in the seventies and they just kind of found places to put baskets and courses wherever they possibly could. Like it's very grassroots sport. And so you look at some of the old courses that are still around, and we actually there was actually a really cool tournament a, few, a month or two ago at a course called De La Viega, which is one of the very earliest disc golf course designs. And disc golf course design early on is almost entirely par threes. So the idea is that they're short enough that you can reach the basket if you execute your shot in one throw. And De La Viega, I believe, is entirely par threes, or maybe there's one par four, and that's where a lot of disc golf courses are. And it's just different routes to try to execute that shot to get close to the basket. And only recently are we seeing more strategic principles being put in place on disc golf courses, which in my mind oftentimes means more par fours. And I'm going to spoil now the Worlds tournament. So we told you to look up Worlds, watch that final round. I'm going to spoil what happens just because I think it's a perfect example of strategic decision making in course design, seeing executed among the players. So on the final hole of worlds, it's a par four. How the hole works is that you have a force carry over water, uh, which isn't a difficult carry for these pros. They, they're not worried necessarily about not making it over the water. Uh, but there's this kind of line of trees, random place trees, uh, just on the other side of the water that they are definitely trying to avoid and get through the trees. Once you get past the trees, it's pretty much open all the way through. Uh, but what they did is they put the basket, they created out of bounds along a pretty narrow, I don't know how you would describe it. Yeah, gap in the grass. Think of it as a, a grandstand. It almost looks like a, a NASCAR yeah. max stretch with grandstands on both sides. Yeah, so Basically, it's just it's open just grass. narrow landing strip. Yeah, it was. it's open grass. 
up to the basket with one tree you have to you have to go around the left of. In disc golf, that's called a mandatory. That's actually one of the unique things to disc golf that ball golf does not have are mandatories. Uh, and they're usually for course safety that they'll have a tree or something where you have to and you have to throw your disc either to the left or right of that tree, usually to avoid roads or or other holes. But because it was just wide open grass, what they did is they carved out a narrow strip leading up to the basket and then only the circle, which again is 10 meters radius from the basket, that was in bounds. Everything outside of that was out of bounds, which is actually a pretty small landing zone even for pros. Uh, So what happened was we have two people who are still in the running on the last hole. We have Paul Macbeth, probably the best player ever. We have James Conrad, who's been a top 10-ish player for the last few years. Macbeth has a one-shot lead. He throws his disc and gets a pretty good result. I would say probably above average result. Gets through the trees decently, but not necessarily as far as he might want. Conrad hits one of the trees and actually almost bounces back into the water. He hits one of the earliest trees, and he's really out of position. Uh, But Macbeth has a one-shot lead, so all he has to do is tie the hole with Conrad, and he wins. Conrad's then in a pickle because he really doesn't have a shot to, a realistic shot to try to hit that green and not go out of bounds with his second, so he pitches up to an open spot and doesn't even attempt to go for the green in two, which right there is a strategic decision, right? He's out of position on his first shot, and has the decision there to really throw a Hail Mary and try to throw the what, probably 450-foot shot to a 60-foot circle in diameter, or he can pitch up and see what happens. And he chooses to pitch up. At the time when I was watching it, I wasn't even sure if that was the right decision. I mean, honestly, I thought he should have gone for it on his second shot. Anyways, Macbeth sees that and also pitches up, also doesn't go for the green, even though he has a much, much better position to go for it. And in any other situation, right, if it wasn't the last hole where all he has to do is tie, probably would have gone for the green there. I would say probably an 85 to 90 percent make from from that position for him. And then the crazy thing happens is that James Conrad has 250 or 247 feet, I believe is the number that has been enshrined, uh, around the mandatory tree, throws it in the hole, throws it in the basket from that, and now Macbeth's decision all of a sudden becomes a very poor decision, although not really. It was the correct decision at the time. Uh, He just got super unlucky because Conrad throws it in, and it's insane. Uh, So then Macbeth pitches up, takes the par, and now they're tied, and they go to a playoff hole, and Conrad wins on the playoff hole. But I think that was really good course design to make that second shot scary because unless then you absolutely lace the first shot, the second shot is a real decision of what to do. Do you play it safe and go for the par or do you try to risk it? And that's really good strategic course design. I was watching some of the interviews of some of the pros after the tournament and there were a decent chunk of them that did not like the hole design on 18. And they gave a variety of reasons, but that hole was definitely new for disc golf. Like it, it's compared to other holes and other tournaments that that have gone throughout the year, it is it holds a very unique place in the fact that it is so strategic and so risk rewardy. So it, it's interesting that I, I found it interesting that there were some pros that did not like it. Well, I mean, was it due to the artificial out of bounds? Because that's typically something I don't like to see a lot in disc golf, where, you know, the course is wide open, so they just kind of create out of bounds. Whereas in a wooded course, the trees kind of do that for you, and it's more natural. I typically don't like artificial out of bounds, but I think that was a perfect, absolutely spot on application of it. I, I agree with that. And I, it wasn't so much the, the, the reasons I heard weren't so much like the artificial out of bounds. That's not what they were citing. It was more just the actual design. They liked it as a finishing hole because it was a finishing hole um, and it made for drama. But from what I heard, they, they weren't too keen on it as it, just a hole in general, mostly just the, the landing zone uh, at the end, 30 feet radius and that narrow landing strip coming up to it just to them it they said it limited their options which is kind of the point i feel like (laughs) well it's uncomfortable 
And I think a lot of, and actually you see this a lot in, in professional ball golf on the PGA tour where at a high level, you want confidence. You want to know that if you hit a shot that you think is correct, that you will be rewarded by that shot. And again, to some degree that is, that should be the case, but I think there's professional pushback against strategic holes because it introduces a new line of thinking and it creates uncomfortable situations, right? For there to be an actual choice, an actual decision in a golf course in either sport, there has to be a moment of uncomfortableness at be- or else that decision isn't a real decision. And I think that's I what the pros don't want. They don't ever want to feel uncomfortable. You know what it reminds me of in ball golf is – I believe it's the Masters. I don't remember what hole it is, but it's the par three water carry with the insanely sloped green that if if you hit it, the final hole location is always very close to the water and super slopey. If you hit it and it it's you spin it back towards the hole and you go past the hole, you're in the water every time. Yeah, hole 12. Uh, 12, yes. But that that's kind of what it reminds me of. Without fail, you get pros complaining about that hole and putting up eights and tens and because they keep going back in the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you saw Tiger Tiger Woods a couple of years ago got like a seven or an eight on it. Yeah. But that's a brilliant hole for a number of reasons. I could I, I've read quite a bit about that. It's it's if you've seen a picture of like Augusta, it's probably the hole they took a picture of. It's a it's a short par three which is rare for a, a major or, or a PGA Tour event because distances become so much easier in the last 10, 20 years. But because the water is there and because shorter shots tend to spin back more, it forces them to be uncomfortable with trying to manipulate the amount of backspin they have. It's also canted at an angle, which is the real brilliance of it, which makes it particularly difficult for right-handed players. So it slopes or the green is angled front left to back right. And why that's uncomfortable is because if you're to miss for a right-handed player, if you miss with a push or a pull, so you hit either to the right or left of your target, typically if you miss with a pull, you will actually add distance to your shot. And if you miss with a push, you will lose distance on your shot. And the green is in the exact opposite configuration of that. So you'll see a lot of misses deep left on that hole, and you'll see if they do land in the water, they're typically missed to the right. It actually makes the hole a little much more comfortable for left-handed players. Uh, I, I think historically the two best lefties on tour, Mickelson and Bubba Watson, uh, have a pretty good track record on that hole for that reason. It's so subtle. It, it's something you wouldn't actually recognize unless you really thought about it and had a good understanding of golf. Anyways, I, I adore that hole. That hole's incredible. But yeah, it, it makes them super uncomfortable because it's also a shot that they feel like they should make. Like it's only, it plays from like 140 to 160 yards for the pros, which in some cases is like a wedge. Like it's, it's a very short hole. And so there's this expectation that I should be able for a pro to land this within a very tight radius of the flag. Uh, but it forces them sometimes to play away from the flag, which is super weird. Uh, it's the same reason that 17 at Sawgrass, the famous island hole, is so uncomfortable because that shot, and that's another very short hole. It's like 140 yards for the pro, from the back tees. And so it's a shot they should hit on the green every time. And if it wasn't completely surrounded by water, their success rate on that shot would be almost 100% of just hitting the green. But because the water's there and it's so large and it makes you feel uncomfortable, their success rate is much lower than it would have otherwise been if all of that water was grass. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And so I think, that's, and I think probably, that's where we need to go yeah. in disc golf a bit more. Yeah, you want um, you want the best players to feel uncomfortable cuz then they're making decisions. And again, it goes hand in hand. If there's an ostensible decision, but they're all super comfortable with the decision they make, then it wasn't a real decision. It's why I think hole two at Maple Hill is such an amazing par three and one of the best par threes in disc golf. Because when you watch the pro coverage at that course, you'll see three to five different types of shots being thrown by all of the pros, which means that they're all having to make decisions about what kind of shot they're going to make. 
you'll see rollers, you'll see straight shots, you'll see people lay up, you'll see big, strong hyzers, you'll see forehands, like you'll see every type of shot to try to get to that hole, which is pretty rare in disc golf for a par three. Most par threes you see, even on the pro level, more or less everyone's attempting the same kind of throw with the same kind of disc. And I think that's where disc golf course design needs to evolve away from. It needs to create situations in which either internally or hopefully both internally and externally, the pros are weighing many different options and trying to find what the best route is for them. What do you think of that? I mean, this is kind of a little bit of an offshoot, but what do you think about that in terms of like uh, grenades and non-traditional shots? So like this, this goes back to, I was watching uh, disc golf tournament coverage. There's a par four out there that is basically a hard dog leg right. It's probably, it's not very long. It's probably like 400 feet, but the, the play is to throw a hundred foot, to 150 to 200 foot putter out into the middle. And then you just go straight right. And it's a par four because it takes two shots to get there. And then over the course of the tournament, you saw more and more players start throwing a grenade or what is basically a, 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 a shot that goes straight up in the air and tries to clear a bunch of trees and come straight down. And they were able to get fairly close to the basket because 400 feet is not an unruly amount of distance for a pro. But that being said, there's still huge risk reward there because if you miss by a little bit, you could, you, you did, you ended up in thick trees that in some cases were very difficult to get out of. Do you remember that whole Mark? I, I do not, but yeah, I, I would say as long as the rough is sufficiently penalizing, I, I think that's interesting, but I think there is more space for that kind of course design in disc golf. And it's one of the major differences between disc golf and regular and, and ball golf is that ball golf is all about the ground. What the ball does in the air is just kind of a medium to get it on the ground and then in the hole, which is obviously in the ground. So ground is much more and more important for, for ball golf design. Disc golf is all about the air. It's all about the pathways in the air because you can shape the disc a lot more in a much more greater variety of ways and in more precise ways than in ball golf. In ball golf, you put side spin on the ball and try to cut it or draw it and it's you can do that and it'll go one it'll curve in one direction. You can't do anything beyond that. You can change the height of the ball with a couple of different methods relative to how that club would normally hit the ball. And you can try to impart side spin on the ball. That's the most you can do in terms of manipulating the pathway that the ball flies on disc. However, because they're gyroscopic and therefore that force tends to pull for a right-handed backhanded throw the disc to curve to the left, you can create double curve shots where what we call flex shots, where you send a disc for again, a right-handed backhanded throw uh, curving to the left at an angle. And then in the disc itself will turn it back to the left. And there's more verticality. You can do skip shots that skip off the ground and then do a more dramatic flare uh, one direction or another. Uh, you can throw like, like, Bubba was saying these shots called grenades that go straight up in the air. You can do overhand throws that have their own unique flight paths. So I think disc golf needs to be much more concerned with the path through the air than, than ball golf and much less concerned with the ground with some exceptions. So I, I mean, in terms of design, that seems decent. It's kind of funky, but I think disc golf also has room to be a bit funkier and weirder. I've, I've heard of people speculating about a disc golf hole that actually creates a vertical path like a vertical path you must get over uh so you can imagine like a row of 20 30 foot high trees that you just have no path through and that you have to throw over i don't know what i think of that it's an interesting thought and perhaps on like one hole per course it might be interesting or you know one a maximum of one hole that kind of thing might be interesting to force people to throw shots they may not throw super often but yeah, I think there's a lot more space there, but I don't have fully developed ideas. I think, though, you do highlight one aspect of both penal and strategic course design is that it creates risk reward or in what you might say in board game 
nomenclature, it creates push your luck situations. Yeah, absolutely. The difference, though, is that the strategic push your luck thing is that you're pushing your luck on creating. It's more sophisticated. The idea is more sophisticated in that you're pushing your luck and you're making decisions in order to set up the next shot more in a more sophisticated way than just oh, I need to execute this in order for my next shot to have like a birdie look versus, you know, a par look, you know, a scramble. I, I would, what, what I would say is it's, this is not really push your luck, but it, in, as far as relation to board games, it's similar to how like in Settlers of Catan, you are playing the odds with what numbers you're getting on the board and you're at the, the whim of the dice, right? Uh, whether you get resources or not. Uh, and, and that, in that sort of way, that's kind of the penal design, if you will. Whereas the strategic would be in that same game, the spreading out your territory across different numbers and going into trading and how that's kind of a bad analogy. No, but I think I it's, think it's more the planning rather than the actual roll of the dice, the luck type thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's about it's about a more sophisticated odds calculation, which obviously are not pure odds. They're estimated odds. Like, you know, you don't have the you, you, you can only guess at your odds of success on any particular shot. So if it's just, OK, I want to play it down the middle of the fairway because that's, you know, that's where you have the most margin for error. That's a very crude decision. right? It's pretty straightforward. If the decision is between two routes, right, left of the bunker or right of the bunker, you then have a multiple sets of odds, both in terms of, okay, what are my chances of being successful going left versus going right? And then the next layer of assuming I execute one of those, what are my odds of having a successful shot into the green on from the left side versus the right side? So I think the strategic line of thought in terms of course design creates much more complex and therefore much more uncomfortable layered decisions. So the final school in traditional golf architecture is called the heroic school of thought. And this one's more emotional than it is mechanical. The heroic school is the idea that you present heroic challenges for the participant to overcome. And it's much more a school of thought designed around recreational play of like you present a large water carry or a grand, you know, downhill shot to a narrow fairway. And it sees golf course design as this kind of series of challenges to overcome. And the idea behind that is that it creates drama. It creates emotion uh, in the play that you you have this big obstacle, this challenge before you, and you either succeed or you fail at it. So in some ways, it shares similarities to the penal idea, uh, but it, it has more emotional stakes to it. And I think those are super exciting. I don't think you should build a course entirely around heroic ideas. Honestly, every course should have a mixture of all three, but I think there are really cool uh, heroic moments. And we see that in disc golf, particularly with island holes, in, in both kinds of golf, really, with island holes. And at the World's Tournament, there was an island hole in hole 16, which was super exciting. That's where the playoff played out. And it's just the situation where you got to throw into a particular area, and if you don't, you fail. If you do, you succeed and you're the hero. And, and I think that kind of emotion and drama, when used judiciously, uh, can make a course really exciting. It can kind of be the thing that brings you back or gets you talking in the moment. Whereas, you know, more subtle strategic design can get you talking about the course design once you contemplate it. But heroic is much more right there in front of you um, and creates a lot of excitement. So for that, I think it's worth mentioning, um, but I think it should be used judiciously. Yeah, I think another one is you can have certain um, either green types for disc golf, like elevated baskets, even just like, especially like if they're extremely elevated can make for a, a heroic type of hole. I know when, when you came over and we played a course, there's, there was one that was basically on top of a, 
almost a log cabin thing. Yeah. Um, it was like uh, those old, uh, what are those toys with the, the, the little logs? Lincoln logs. Lincoln logs. Yeah, it was like, yeah, the they set like up that. like 30 feet worth of Lincoln logs and you had to throw your disc all the way up top. And it was, it was cool. It's just, it's almost like little things that make you smile. And like, if, if you really thought about it, really have no place being in disc golf or golf, but like, there's no reason that they can't be either. You know, the hmm? parallel for board games here is when a game allows like a combo strat, right? Where you can try to build either a deck or a strategy where if executed, you get to pull off a really cool long turn where you combine different cards or movements or ideas into one big conquering combo attack versus games that don't have that option. And a lot of times, you know, if the game, if it's done well, again, it's difficult in board gaming. If it's done well, having that option available to people can create really exciting moments. Sure. And you don't even have to win necessarily with that strategy. Sometimes, sometimes the joy is just executing it, uh, regardless of whether it gives you the most points or, or, or whatnot. Yeah. And I think the raised basket actually also demonstrates how, you know, we talk about these as schools of thought. But they're not discreet by any means, right? When if you have a raised basket, especially if you have like a, a water behind it or out of bounds behind it, uh, that's a strategic decision right there. Do you lay up or do you go for that putt? But it's also a heroic decision because uh, if you decide to go for it, you can be you know the little hero in your mind. Uh, but they play into each other. So, you know, these are three ideas, but they certainly interweave and interact constantly. They're, they're, they're not discreet by any means. Uh, so the, f the final topic I think we can go over here is how do we think disc golf course design should progress? How should have it evolve into the future? Uh, I think you already hit on one of the big things that I think we both agree on is that there needs to be more par fours, par fives. To start off, many of the courses out there right now rely either solely or basically rely on par threes as their bread and butter. And I don't think that's necessarily terrible, but there's so much design space in par fours and par fives, especially when you talk about strategic shots. The, the upshot in disc golf is not used nearly enough. And the variety of upshots that exist. Um, so I'll get into one very, very unique thing about disc golf. Actually, it's not super unique because you have spin in ball golf. Uh, in ball golf, when you have a short approach, say like 100, 150 yards or something like that, you can play with the green by putting spin on the ball and you can very, you can finesse your ball closer to the hole. Like when you're that close, hitting the ball onto the green is, is not good enough in ball golf. You have to get it close to the hole. If, because, if you're good at golf. Yes. Yeah, yes. I'm sorry. Um, and I think the same thing can apply to disc golf and that's not used almost at all. I very rarely see that. And what I'm talking about is these shots from like shorter than par three distance. So your standard par three distance in disc golf when you're talking like just like an average Joe Schmo going out to a disc golf course, you're, you're looking at 300 feet, roughly. More or less, 300 feet is like your standard par three distance. So what I'm talking about is shots in the 100 plus to like 200 foot range. Those shots that are shorter than a par three, but have a different type of finesse. And in disc golf, what you can do is something that you do not typically want to do with disc golf shots is to angle the disc in such a way that the nose of the disc is up. And what that does is it gets air under the disc and it doesn't let it fly as far. Typically, when you're throwing a power shot, a, a driver, you want your nose, what they say, to be nose down. Or really, it's just nose even with the wind. Or um, even slightly and, down. I've, I've read that the physics of the disc, even if it's nose down, it still generates some vertical lift. But what you can do, you can throw a disc, obviously, nose up. If you've ever played Ultimate Frisbee, many Ultimate Frisbee throws, in fact, that disc is designed in such a way that a lot of times you do actually throw that disc more nose up than you would a disc golf disc. 
And what that does is it creates a different type of lift, lift on the disc that slows the disc down. And it lets you settle the disc onto the ground instead of coming into the ground at such a speed that you get skips and whatnot. And I don't think that that's nearly used enough in disc golf right now, where you get these shorter approaches that are finicky, that require different types of nose angles to attack the green. Um, and that's one thing that I would say, and, and you can only do that with par fours. It's not... It's not something you can do with a par three, because if you throw a 200 foot par three at pros, they're going to eat it for breakfast. No matter what's in the way. <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Um, so what you have to do is you have to make it a par four where your drive puts you in this ideal landing spot. That's only 200 feet from the basket where you can throw this nice finicky shot that gives you 10 foot for birdie. And I, I, again, I just, I think that that's not nearly seen enough where your drive is not to the basket. Your drive is setting up this ideal landing zone. Yeah. And I think actually part of what makes De La Viega, which is a course I mentioned before, one of the oldest disc golf courses that's, I think it's, it's, it's certainly the oldest course that's still played at the highest levels on, on the pro tour. Um, one of the, I think one of the reasons why it remains that even though a lot of the holes are relatively short compared to other courses the pros play is that a lot of the baskets are perched right on like the edge of a cliff essentially and so it forces these uncomfortable decisions where the pros need to land their shots very softly just what you were talking about on you know 250 to 350 foot shots, uh, which is extremely difficult to do. And again, the par four situation makes it interest more interesting and in, in, generally because the difference between landing or throwing a nose up shot that lands soft from 200 feet and mm -hmm. doing that same shot at 300 feet, even for a really good pro is big. And so if you present a challenge to them or maybe a decision of whether or not to go for the 200 foot landing shot uh, landing zone or the 300 foot landing zone creates, again, another a co more complicated set of decisions if it's a par four. But yeah, I, I completely agree. And in the reason that par threes are kind of the bread and butter for disc golf is just, again, because of the origin of the sport. It's kind of scrappy and they were just trying to find space where they could find it, where they could actually play the game. And so it's oftentimes and even still a matter of like trying to actually find space to build a course and just being thankful with the locations that you have. But even in that situation, I think courses would be much better served by trying to create the best holes they can and not really disregard how many holes there are. Like it's been super standard for, you know, multiple few hundred years in ball golf uh, that a full course is 18 holes and then you can have nine hole courses, but that doesn't, that's just completely arbitrary. That's just tradition in disc golf. Why, why do we care about that? Indeed, there are courses that are played on the pro tour that are not 18 holes. Uh, some of them are like 22 holes. And then I think that's perfectly fine. So a lot of times when I'm like reviewing courses or I'm playing through a course, there'll be holes that I know were put in there just to make it 18 holes. Like it was just thrown in there, squeezed in. It's a little rinky dink hole, nothing to it. And I'm like, oh, the course designer just wanted to make this 18 holes. What I would rather see, I'd rather play a, a 12 hole course of really great holes than an 18 hole course that was squeezed into the property, uh, which I think can be a solution when you have you know, tough time getting land uh, for your courses. I also think that, I think that playing in the woods or at least with trees or other similar obstacles in the air is almost fundamental to disc golf. And I think it's very hard to get outside of that for a course and still remain fun and interesting. And that's something that the Pro Tour is struggling with right now because a lot of their best venues and the best venues for spectators are in more open locations. So they've been building disc golf courses on top of ball golf courses. And in my mind, it doesn't create very interesting holes, or at least it's extremely difficult to make interesting holes. And even then, the bar is kind of lower, lower of what an interesting hole is. I think I agree with that. There, I would say that there are definitely still... There, I do think there 
there's room for open holes. And mainly because you have, just like in ball golf, you have two different sides of, of the disc, right? You've got, and it's even more impactful in disc golf where you can hook and, well, in, in ball golf, it's hooking and slicing, but in disc golf, you can throw a disc left and right and have it curve left and right. And some people's forehands are better than their backhands and vice versa. And like there, there's room for holes that you can attack it either direction. I think that's a good thing. I also think it's a good thing to force a certain direction as well. So like, I think ideally you have courses that have both, um, both open and wooded, if you will. Yeah, and you see the best, like the highest rank courses largely do, which is why one reason why I think Maple Hill is is consistently ranked the best course in the world and certainly the best course I've played. It's because it does do that really well. It has open holes and wooded holes, and it utilizes those things very, very well. Um, The other thing I think you see a lot in disc golf that you see less of in ball golf, but it does exist, is elevation. I haven't played a ton of ball golf courses with elevation but the ones that i have played are super super fun hitting hitting a ball off the side of a mountain there's nothing else like that and and the same goes for disc golf throwing a disc down a mountain there's there's something about that that's so much fun and it also brings footing into play which is another great aspect that you can use um, to make landing zones more or less friendly to play yeah, in both games being on a side hill slope is super awkward and annoying and it creates right. uncomfortable throws or, or shots um in in both yeah i think elevation's super critical in 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 you know as disc golf improves they're going to get access to better property which which is exciting because that often means elevation i think and okay. also with elevation it actually affects discs a lot more than golf balls so like throwing up a decent hill in in disc golf can easily cut my distance my maximum distance in half up an incline up that same incline with ball golf you're looking at maybe 20% reduction maximum uh you know it's a club or two so like for instance if i'm hitting an iron shot in ball mm-hmm. golf up a say 50 foot tall hill onto a green I'm thinking that's like a club and a half distance. That's like 10 to 15 yards I have to add to my shot to get there. If I'm going 50 feet up in disc golf, I'm trying to throw my farthest shot possible. Like it <laughs> can easily cut my distance in half. And so it becomes a lot more significant. And even downhill becomes a lot more significant. Like you get the right spin on the disc on a downhill th- shot, like a significantly downhill throw, that could just keep gliding forever because there's glide involved a ball doesn't really glide uh it's just a matter of like the angles more than the actual glide of the object uh so elevation you can actually play with a lot in a lot more interesting ways i think in disc golf than in ball golf i think in ball golf it's much more it's it's more subtle it's about your your footing uh on your shot because if you're on a side hill lie it'll push your ball kind of downhill uh, in the direction of the downhill, so you have to adjust for that. But in disc golf, like you can do a lot with a pretty small amount of elevation to affect it. And in both cases, it's interesting because the downhill shot is super fun, but it increases your margin of error. Or rather, it it increases the margin by which you can error because uh, a small error in accuracy will be compounded by a downhill shot in both games, uh, which makes it both fun and very terrifying. So you often throw very fun shots downhill, but the results are often not what you wanted, even if you (laughs) think you did pretty well on it, uh, which which is an interesting aspect. So let's bring this now back to board games. And I, I think we've discussed this a lot, but I wanted to kind of sum up some of the similar ideas that we see in board games and in these athletic games, these sports. Uh, so I think push your luck or at least like odds calculations is gotta be the predominant one in board games with any amount of uncertainty, uh, which is kind of key to board games, but even like strict uncertainty, things that you 
cannot theoretically predict with 100% accuracy. You have to play odds. So that could be the odds of the dice, the deck of cards. It could be the odds of what your opponent is going to do and what you suspect that they might do. In golf, you got to play the odds of your own skill, the randomness of physics, and what the result will be, you know, how are you setting up your next shot? And so I think there's so much parallel there. And perhaps the lesson is that if you create a consistent challenge and create uncomfortable decisions, I think you can get away with a good amount of uncertainty and chaos even in your game if the decision point at each step along the way is a real decision that creates that 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 is again another calculation of odds in a complex one interesting i don't know how much i agree and maybe that's because i'm thinking of it more from a pro level but i think of it more along the lines of like uh playing billiards almost so like in billiards yeah you can go out there and just shoot pool balls in but if you're never going to do well unless you're thinking about your next shot. Um, And the same goes for golf, disc golf, and many, many, many board games as well. You can play the optimal move every single turn in board games and lose badly because you're not thinking about two moves ahead. And in golf and billiards, you need to. You can't just hit your golf ball 350 yards straight, and that may not be the best shot every single time. Um, Unless your name it, is Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, even for him, though. <laughs> even for him. Well, I mean, that was, his his win at uh, the U.S. Open last year was a big talking point in golf course architecture circles because he did not play that course as people thought it ought to be played. And from an architecture perspective, I kind of agree that the course was not great because it could be conquered in that way where you just hit as far as you can on almost every hole and be fine with the results. And I think, you know, golf course architecture, that's a challenge that you have to overcome uh, in both games, right? If, if if distance is the only skill that really matters, it's a failure of design. Yeah, and same can be said about board games too. And that goes back to your, your foo strategies. Like if your foo strategy is your optimal strategy, it's a failure in design. And like, I would argue that hitting the golf ball as far as you possibly can straight is a foo strategy in a way. And if that is the optimal strategy on a golf course, then, then what are you doing? Your, your design is terrible. Uh, that's a great analogy. I didn't, I didn't thought of the relationship between that and foo strategies, but that, that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, for those who didn't hear that podcast, foo is a first order optimal strategy. Uh, if you just look up that phrase, you'll get more details about it. There's also the aspect of practice and mastery, which, you know, is kind of what brings you back to both golf, disc golf and board games. If once once you get to a point where you understand, like, the best play to make in any given situation in a board game, you're probably bored with that board game. Like, you're, you're probably done with it. The fact that you're always pursuing mastery but never quite reach it is compelling, and that's what brings you back to the best games, I think. Uh, the chess is the perfect example here. Like computers haven't even solved chess. Everyone's still pursuing mastery in that game. There's always going to be someone better with with a better strategy, with better tactics, what have you. It, it's almost like addiction, like in some cases, right? It's just like, oh, I know I could do better there, and I know. I didn't like and I want to do it like I often finish golf rounds or disc golf rounds I'm like man if I could I just want to get back on the course and play again actually one of the benefits of disc golf is that the rounds finish much quicker so oftentimes I do play two rounds in a day uh, whereas if you did that with ball golf it would literally take all day but yeah it's that it's that compelling like drive and like you know the, the example in board games is like, when's the last time you played tic-tac-toe? I, I don't care if I ever play that again because I've solved it. Like It's very easily solvable for humans to do, and then you're done with it. There's no need to play it again. So it's, it's always pursuing excellence without ever reaching the end. And I think the best games and the best sports, in, in, in my mind, these are two of the best sports, make that very clear that you could improve you could become better but you haven't yet yeah another uh board game analogy 
uh, that I would bring up would be uh, your your setup variations. So like in, in many games, uh, you're given um, either starting powers or variations in setup, like whether your starting resources are different. I think you can compare that to like uh, hole locations and basket locations on, on or even course. playing different courses. Or even playing different courses. That that's fair. Or even just less so hole to hole, but but yeah. Or or hey, heck, wind conditions. Wind plays a huge factor in in both sports. And when you go out for a tournament that's four days long in ball golf, Saturday might be completely different from Friday, just based on the conditions out there. Mm -hmm. And if there isn't variation, right, the game has to be sufficiently good enough to handle that, right? So the greatest games uh, are still great, even if you play with the same starting setup each time. And I think that's true for courses too, right? You, particular golf courses or disc golf courses, right? If I, if I was only able to play Maple Hill the rest of my life, I would still play lots of disc golf, right? It's that good of a course. And the courses that aren't able to, to sustain that, uh, they start to show their faults, right? There's a reason they can't sustain that. So, you know, variability can cover up for a lot. Like, I enjoy seeking out new disc golf or golf courses, uh, even if they don't end up being okay, just because it's a novel experience. But it's the great ones that you can play over and over and over and still find new things and find interesting things. And I think it's the same for board games. You can still discover new and great things in chess and go, even though it's the same setup each time or, or even something like, you know, twilight struggle or, or something like that, which doesn't, I mean, there's the shuffle of the cards, but doesn't really have any variation in setup. The final thing I thought is that there's also a distinction in how you optimize. So Normally, when you're going out and just playing around a golf, it's a top score game. You're trying to just get the best score possible. And oftentimes it's, you know, you're competing against your prior top scores, like in many solo games. However, in both sports, you have head to head formats. So you have match play or similar or skins play or similar things where you're specifically competing against another person in that round and not just like top score for the tournament. Uh, and that can change your decision making dramatically. And that makes for a, almost a different style of game. I know in, in professional golf, there are people who are known as particularly good match play players uh, as opposed to stroke play players. And it, it takes a different mindset. And in games, certain games, you might just be going for the top score. And that changes compared to games where you're specifically going head to head or more directly head to head against other players. Or as I talked about with Amber in the last podcast, you have the the king making optimal uh, or the king making context uh, decision of what you want to optimize for. So we were talking about how, right, if you're in a position where you cannot win the game, uh, towards the end of the game and you're trying to avoid king making i think there are two rational ways to optimize you either optimize your score so you try to get the highest total score possible or you optimize for rank you try to get the highest rank possible even though you know you can't get first i think those are both legitimate uh, but they change the way you play the game uh it becomes you create more zero sum situations if you're going for rank if not you're you you just go for highest score possible and golf and disc golf have this a similar thing going on yeah so uh i think that's everything i wanted to say about this i mean i could go on and on talking about different holes but i don't want to get too inside baseball hopefully if you're not a fan of either golfs uh, that you still were able to follow along what we were saying or at least look up maybe a couple key phrases and figure it out uh but yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about, Baba? Frustration design, very briefly. Oh, yeah. Good, good, and, good idea. And specifically with that, like, it's something that comes up with disc golf courses more right now, just because they're more in their infancy. Um, there's a number of holes out there that are very linear in their design in that, hey, you have to hit this five or 10 foot gap. If you don't, you're in trouble. Or there's some that are even worse that are like, hey, 100 feet in front of you, the, the, the pin is 300 feet down this hill, but 100 feet in front of you, you have 
this grove of random small trees that you just have to find your way through. And more or less, it's just a crapshoot whether you get your disc through them or not. And certainly this is bad design, but I think there's some major parallels you can draw with board game design here too, in that there, there's board games out there that that suffer from this exact same thing of these roadblocks that just do not feel good. Um, you step up to the tee at this golf and you just wing it. You just throw it out there and hope. And that's bad design by the book, if you will. I completely agree. And I also think it's not even necessarily an objective measure of what kind of situation creates those emotions because it's all about the illusion of control and you want to i wonder if there's if there's really specific like psychological studies about this but in both sports you want to have some amount of control or at least the feeling that you have some amount of control over the outcome even though there's tons of variability of what happens after you release the disc or hit the ball And there's tons of variability in like the minute movements of your own body that you're probably not at a skill yet, a skill level yet to understand or manipulate. But there's a, as long as you have meet this kind of threshold of feeling like you have some control or hope over the outcome, uh, then it's fine. And it's those kinds of holes that bring you below that threshold where it's like, okay, no matter what I do, I don't feel like I have control over the outcome. And I think sometimes that can be a very fine line, uh, in, in both the sports and in board games, whereas in board games, even high luck board games, you want to feel like you have some amount of control over what's going on. So you look at a game like can't stop, which is like your classic push your luck game. There's so much variability going on there but you have that little bit of control of whether or not you cash in or you keep pushing your luck whereas other games and i can't think of one off the top of my head there are other games i played where i feel like man i have no i've i have so little control over my outcome here that i feel defeatist like I, I yeah i feel like, like you you've actually that. used this line before like certain certain games that that are out there that even games that you've reviewed in the past will give you the illusion of control, if you will, where you you do a bunch of actions, you do some stuff, and it spits out this output. And this output is just like points or maybe resources. or And then you look back on it and you look at your decisions that you made throughout the game and you're like, this was more or less scripted. And there there's... There's games like that that are, or or not even sometimes it's scripted or sometimes it's like oh wait this really just came down to a roll of the dice on turn one that doesn't feel nice yeah in board games it's often about your ability to comprehend the position so I I remember now the game where I made this argument most strongly was with Hanami Koji, which I do like quite a bit as a game, but because it's a game with so few cards, uh, I don't remember if it's a proper micro game or not. It might be that if you really analyzed it, I think in many different setups, as long as both players have a good understanding of the cards, the outcome can be determined. I won't say easily, but it can be determined based on who has which cards and which cards were not in play. And so once you peek that, you peek at the possibility of that, like the, the illusion breaks down, which, which is fascinating in, in board games. And I, and I think designers need to really watch out for that. Uh, like once you get more knowledge of a, of a board game, the game should either continue to be excellent or even improve. And I think that's kind of the mark of a really great game is that as you gain knowledge, the board game continues to be engaging at an equal or greater level if you can peek at like behind the curtains there i just wrote about like the borders of the game you get where you understand the borders of the game and you see kind of deterministic things happening it it can ruin your time yeah and that that goes straight back to that disc golf hole too right Mm -hmm. so like you you get a beginner out there throwing a disc golf uh, a disc at that hole that we were talking about with trees everywhere where it's a crapshoot if you make it through. 
they won't care. They'll have fun just throwing the disc at the basket. And if they hit a tree or not, they're not going to care because they're a beginner. Whereas as you get more and more skill, that that line should open up. There should be a line there for you to get. And actually, or, just even in my progression as a player improving, I have revisited holes that I thought were frustrating in a crapshoot, and I revisit them. I'm like, oh, no, there's a line there, and I, I feel like I can hit it. So it's almost like at the beginning, you're like, okay, whatever. It's I'm, I'm not very good yet. And then you get some skill, and you start to think that more things are true crapshoots. And then as you keep gaining skill, more of those holes start to feel accessible to your skill level. Which, which is an interesting dynamic. I, I've definitely yes. experienced that with a couple. Yeah, I, and now that you say that, I think I have too. But uh, they, there's holes that still exist that are just like, in my opinion, like just have no business being a hole. But, yeah, it's like what level of precision can you expect even from the best players? Like I remember Paul was talking about like if you want to compete at the highest level, Paul Macbeth, the best player in the world, I was talking about in one of his videos, like if you want to be at the highest level of, of the pro tour, you got to be able to hit a 10 foot gap at 350 feet. But like, you know, if he was confronted with a lot of five foot gaps, at 150 at uh, 350 feet, would he, would he feel the same as that? Like a skill thing? Or is that then too chaotic for him? Uh, I wonder where that line is for like even the best player. Yeah. That's interesting. I think that's our time. We've gone on quite a bit. I I was scared that we would not have enough time. Like we wouldn't have enough material for this podcast to be like. A <laughs> and uh, I think it's going to be one of our longer ones of recent memory. Uh, but thank you so much, Bubba, for coming on. I always love podcasting with you and I love golf in all of its forms, or at least both of its forms that I am aware of. Well, there's there's also foot golf, right? There's the soccer golf. There's the soccer golf. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I've never played it, but I'm gonna say it's not nearly as interesting. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I will. I will offer that challenge if anyone wants to defend. Do they call it foot golf? I think so. And equal to one of these two, then uh, I don't know. That would be an interesting discussion. Uh, they got to put you on the spot, Mark. Though. Oh yeah, yeah what's your favorite right now? I mean, going back in your life, it's always been ball golf, but right now, right now you're playing the disc golf tournaments. What, what, if you had to drop one of the two sports for the rest of your life, which would it be? Oh, uh, <laughs> if, if I was, if, if money wasn't an option, ball golf would win a hundred percent of the time. Fair enough. Like it's literally an accessibility issue. If I was given free golf for the rest of my life and the condition was that I had to stop playing disc golf, I would sell my discs immediately. I think ball golf is the better game because I think there's a lot more precision uh, involved. I think the precision of it and the challenge of it is challenging all the way through. And this is one, actually one aspect where I think I was going to mention, but haven't. And that is the, the short game. Uh, we are talking about it a bit like the professionals, like the best putters in the world are pretty close to what I think peak putting in disc golf will become. I think for ball golf, there's a lot more space to improve. And that actually plays into course design. I wasn't, I didn't necessarily get into that, but like we were talking about how circle one, so 30 feet, which technically is between like 10 and 30 feet. The average touring pro hits about 80% of the time. On the PGA Tour, an 80... I don't know if I've told you this, but if yeah, I you haven't... Did. Oh, you did, yeah. Uh, an 80% success rate on the PGA Tour is a five-foot putt. Oh, I thought it was eight feet from what you five said. Five feet. Five feet. Wow. Yeah. Uh, eight feet would... I, I think eight feet might be the 50%. Okay. Is 50% like circle's edge? Probably between 30 and 40 feet. So they measure the stats that are kept are circle one is 3.3 meters to 10 meters on UDISC. And then they keep circle two, which would be 10 to 20 meters. Uh, so circle one average is about 80%. Circle two average, so the 10 to 20 meters, is you know, 20, low 20s. Like Paul Macbeth's absolutely lighting it up from circle two, and I think he's at like 35%. Uh, but there's only like one or two people last time I checked who were in the 30s. So somewhere around, I'd say between 30 to 40 feet is probably the 50% zone for the professional, uh, which is a 
good amount of space away, right? Like, yeah. uh, you know, 30 feet is 10% of your average par three. Five feet on a golf course is far, far less of a percentage uh, for a par three in golf. So it's the short game is fundamentally easier in disc golf. And I think that's the edge that ball golf has. Uh, it also has, you know, the aesthetics of it. There's the course. There's a lot more money put into it, so the courses are much more beautiful. And I've been playing it more, so the, I think there's subjective things that make it a better fit for me. But I think objectively, it, I can make an argument that ball golf is a better game. Uh, that said, I love disc golf. <laughs> <laughs> I love that it's cheaper, and I love that it taps into a lot of the same feelings. And I love that I can play around. If I'm by myself, I can sometimes get around 18 holes in like an hour. Whereas on a ball golf course, even by myself, I'm looking at three hours. Right. How about you? You you just play more disc golf in general, right? Uh, yeah, I don't you play know. a ton of ball golf. Yeah, yeah. I play ball golf as just like a. Like you said, it's so expensive. I don't, I don't enjoy it nearly as much, mostly because it's a slog to me. It's just so long. But when I'm out there, I enjoy. It. I, enjoy, I just more. I enjoy being outside and walking around. Sure. So this golf checks all those boxes for me. And like you said, it's shorter, and I'm, I'm probably better at it too. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm, I'm still. I think compared to like a professional level, I am better at ball golf than I am disc golf. But I think I'm rapidly reaching that point again thanks everyone for listening uh if you'd like to see more about disc golf again you can follow my youtube channel mark underscore disc golf uh, mark spelled with a c not a k and i have a few videos up there and some stuff and uh if you want to learn more about the sport hit me up i'm on social media twitter facebook and instagram and for more about board game specific stuff except for one article where i did write about uh disc golf uh, you can go to the thoughtfulgamer.com if you'd like to support the podcast and everything I do. Go to patreon.com/slash thethoughtfulgamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.